Welcome. Good evening, good afternoon. I want to send out a welcome to the students in Oregon, in North Carolina, to folks in Florida, and in Massachusetts, and also to the handful of students who have decided to come in live tonight here with me. We'll present, be presenting a lecture on um, confronting the stigma of mental illness with empowerment and advocacy. My name is Cheryl Gagney, and I am a Senior Research and Training Associate at the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation here at Boston University. The Center is a research and training institute, um, which has uh, three separate um, uh, branches that inform one another. The first is a research branch in which we study and do research in the field of mental health, primarily focusing on people who experience the most severe psychiatric illnesses and consequently experience psychiatric disability. Our training division uh, conducts training such as this, but also um, across the country and internationally, conducting training to practitioners, family members, and people who use mental health services. Um, and finally, our services division, uh, last but not least, we are able to offer uh, people in the greater Boston area uh, psychiatric rehabilitation services that are recovery oriented. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about the Recovery Education Center later in this presentation. I want to turn to the agenda. Um, for tonight's um, lecture. We're going to begin by talking very briefly about some definitions and concepts. Um, we're going to talk also about the relationship of stigma and mental illness. Why is mental, mental illness stigmatized? Um, we'll hit upon the consequences of stigma. How does that impact the lives of people who live with psychiatric illness, how, if their family members, and indeed all people in society? Um, next, we'll look at uh, coping and confronting stigma. How can we live with stigma in our presence and work to cope with it personally, but also reduce it in our society? Um, I will be talking about a particular program that we offer here in our Recovery Education Center called the Anti-Stigma Empowerment and Advocacy Photo Voice. And finally, I want to talk about stigma and discrimination on college campuses. Okay, I think it's very relevant, particularly for college students, to look at the presence of the stigma of mental illness on college campuses today. So I won't be talking a lot about research, although there's a huge body of research. And I really won't be touching upon cultural aspects of stigma, although it's fascinating and I encourage you to read it. Um, I want to begin with a slide first to anchor us into the, the why are we doing this? Why do we even care about stigma and mental illness? Um, just to kind of begin by thinking about its seriousness and its impact. And again, we'll talk about some other consequences later. But I wanted to make the point that for many people, stigma is the most difficult aspect of the, mental, the experience of mental illness to overcome. Stigma prevents people from getting treatment and support services for their condition. Stigma fuels discrimination of people who have been diagnosed with mental illness. Stigma also fuels fear and mistrust in our society. And finally, stigma is pervasive. It's very difficult to eliminate. And it's, it's quite, um, you know, it's not a thing of the past. Someone was saying to me, you know, I can't believe it's not 1940 anymore, and yet we're still dealing with a lot of stigma about mental illness, despite the information that's known about uh, neurological problems, brain disorders, about the fact that most mental illnesses have treatment that is effective, uh, enabling people, supporting people to live full lives. And I have a recent and relevant experience, um, a story that came from our Boston Globe just this Sunday. And it's a story uh, about a woman named uh, Maria Hornbacher, who is a, an author. She's written three books, a young woman. And her most recent book is called Madness, A Bipolar Life, which is a firsthand account of her experience. And I'm going to read what she wrote about this experience at a book signing. I don't know if you've ever gone to a book signing, but they're wonderful, and the author will read aloud and talk about what motivated her writing, and then afterwards sign books if people purchase them there. 
Um, so here's what Mariah, um, Maria, sorry, Maria Hornbacher says. Um, I recently wrote a memoir on living with bipolar disorder. I was signing books at a lecture. A woman came up to the table, and after saying all sorts of earnest things about how important it was to break down stigma, broaden understanding, and so forth, she suddenly gasped. Is that a wedding ring on your hand, she asked. I looked down, and indeed it was a wedding ring. So I said, yes. You're married, she asked. I said that I was. My God, she said, he must be an amazing man. Um, off and on, more or less, she replied. Well, she said, looking alarmed, but you don't have children, do you? I mean, you wouldn't want to pass on your genes. I froze. Right, I said, and smiled and signed her book. Apparently, I hadn't quite made my point, because after 45 minutes of going on about the fact that mental, the facts that mental illness is highly treatable, that one can live and live well when one has it, and that my life as a person with mental illness is quite average. She'd come away with mentally ill people are so warped that it's a miracle anyone can stand being married to them, let alone allow them to inflict, allow them to inflict themselves on a baby. So that's an example of you know, how pervasive and how present stigma continues uh, to be. I'm going to turn now to the definition of stigma, just to kind of get us all on the same um, page with this. And there are four definitions that are mentioned here. The first one is a small mark, spot, or hole, and that one's more from a biological perspective. The one we're going to consider most in our discussion tonight is this second one, a mark of disgrace or infamy, infamy a stain or reproach. That's the sociological ex explanation of stigma. Third, a mental or physical mark that is characteristic of a defect or disease. And most of us have heard the word stigmata to refer to the marks resembling the crucified work, um, wounds of Jesus Christ. Um, so these are the four definitions that appear in most dictionaries about stigma, stigmata as the plural of stigma. The origin of stigma as, a, as an idea of a mark um, came from ancient Greece, as many things in our culture do today. Um, the word stigma meant mark, and that marks were placed on slaves to identify their position in society. If not by the mark, you couldn't tell by looking who was a slave and who was a citizen. And people have always, throughout written history, uh, needed to know where they stand in relation to another person. And so throughout history, people have been given marks, either through our dress or our um, or physical marks placed upon us, to know where do I stand in relation to this person. And that's particularly true when we don't know the other person. Um, one of the earlier writers about stigma was the great American sociologist um, Irving Goffman, who wrote the highly influential book, Stigma, Notes on the Management of a Spoiled Identity. Um, he suggests that stigma has really two components, both equal, equal in power. One is a public component, and that is um, the reaction that the general public has to a stigmatized group. So this is external stigma coming in. The public has against another person. But equally powerful, he asserts, is the sense of self-stigma, and that is the negative feelings towards self that people who are stigmatized turn toward themselves. Okay? So that, that both forces act upon an individual person to marginalize them in society, both the external stigma and the internalized stigma. And his books are, you know, continue to be as relevant today as they were when he wrote them in the early 60s. I think he, in all of his books, he makes a very passionate defense of the individual self um, against society. So that the, the need for the self to express itself in a society that may stifle it. Um, and Stigma uh, was one of his uh, most uh, referenced books. So we talked about internalized and external stigma from Goffman. Um, Link and Phelan go further to sort of um, uh, conceptualize four components of stigma. 
Um, and these components are first, labeling and uh, differentiation. Labeling is just la giving characteristics of a person. Someone is tall, they're short, they're blonde, they're fat, they're single, they're rich, they live in Wellesley. So these are just labels that we might put on something. They don't in and of themselves perhaps have much meaning. The next aspect of, of stigma though is linking that to stereotypes. Okay, and that is linking a set of beliefs to a label. So if we say, you know, blondes are dumb, <laughs> you know, they, they uh, have more fun though, and they're promiscuous. <laughs> so those are the kind of the stereotypes of, of blondes. Um, now again, not all stereotypes have negative connotations. You know, the idea of blondes having more fun is not necessarily a negative connotation. Um, but with stigma, negative connotation happens, that the, the, the characteristics associated with the stereotypes are devalued. They're not, um, pr you know, um, uh, prized in the uh, society. And then, on, uh, thirdly, there's an us versus them disconnect. My group and your group. There's a, a real disconnect mentality. You know, so for example, people on welfare uh, spend my hard-earned money. Okay, so the stigmatized group being people who are living in poverty, uh, having public support, who spend my tax dollar. The us versus them mentality. Um, and so stigma, all four characteristics need to be present. Um, this loss of status and discrimination is the result of stigma but all need to be present for stigma to happen. Labeling, stereotype, um, and creating an us versus them connotation. And there needs to be a consequence of that. So therefore, the person is marginalized. Um, okay, um, we'll, we'll be talking about some aspects of these components, but we wanna talk a little bit about why is mental illness um, stigmatized? What, what is it about mental illness that causes it to be a stigmatized condition and has been a stigmatized condition for much of our history. Um, I do wanna make one cultural point here that it's not true in every culture that mental illness is stigmatized. That'd be something interesting to read up on if you have time. Not every culture stigmatizes people with mental illness. But in our, you know, mental illnesses that are, that are associated with symptoms that the average person hasn't experienced are more stigmatized than those that are more common. So for example, the diagnosis of schizophrenia, which often has symptoms that the average person perhaps has not experienced, audio hallucination, thought disorder, um, ideas of reference, uh, visual hallucinations, is much more stigmatized than say um, major depression, which may have, more people can identify with the, with the symptoms or the experience of depression. Um, and it's also true um, that people are fascinated with stories of mental illness and violence. The media bias, um, which amplifies the presence of mental illness, particularly if it's in, associated with a story of graphic violence. And this works both ways, the media bias and the public's hunger for those kinds of stories. Um, and you know, it's interesting that because despite many um, studies to the contrary, people with mental illness are viewed as violent, um, when in fact they are much more likely to be victims of violence than to perpetrate any violence. But we never hear if a victim is experiencing mental illness, only if a perpetrator. Um, so this belief that people with mental illnesses are unpredictable, incompetent, um, and hopeless um, are, informs a lot of the, the news media um, and also, also the entertainment media, if you think about movies and uh, television shows. The next slide continues to say more about why mental illnesses are stigmatized. I mean, I think in, in, in general that the name mental illnesses implies that it's very different from a physical illness. It's in a category all onto itself. And because of that, or in addition to that, some people uh, believe that mental illnesses are caused 
uh, by moral flaws or poor choices. That there's no other basis for it but poor choices in people in their lives. Some people also believe that the person could just get over it if he tried hard enough. So that again, it's a moral flaw that the person doesn't have the willingness to um, overcome their mental illness. And if they did, they would no longer be struggling. And I also want to make the point that mental illnesses can lead to other stigmatized conditions. Either the illness itself, stigma and the illness, or the treatment for many mental illnesses can lead to other stigmatized conditions. And so one's not only dealing with the stigma of mental illness, but perhaps also the stigma of poverty, which in this country is seen as a shameful thing. Um, obesity, many of the medications increase a person's, uh, you know, a body mass a great deal. Obesity is a highly stigmatized condition in the United States. Poor dental health, you know, uh, dental health in this country is a socioeconomic indicator, and so it's, it's, a stigmati it's very stigmatizing to have poor dental health. And then extrapyramidal signs, neurological signs that I am using medication or that I have used medication and having neurological signs are also um, very stigmatized. And so people who are living with mental illness are um, experiencing stigma from a variety of sources. Okay, we'll go to the next slide because I want to talk about um, the consequences of stigma for people with mental illness. The, one of the biggest consequences is the estimates that over two-thirds or nearly two-thirds of people who have diagnosable mental illnesses do not seek treatment. So two-thirds don't seek treatment because, in part or wholly, um, due to, to um, the stigma of mental illness. People live with distressing symptoms for a long time before seeking treatment. Okay. Um, people with mental illnesses may not know that recovery is possible. It is true um, that mental health professionals are not immune to the stigma of mental illness, that mental health professionals may also perpetuate the stigma. And they do this when they deliver uniformly pro poor prognosis, pro prognoses to people with mental illness, when in fact most people can and do recover from mental illnesses. Um, they do this when they have very low expectations. They communicate stigma in their uninspiring programs, in their, um, you know, uh, hopeless feeling environments. Um, and so that people with mental illnesses don't get the message that recovery is possible. And in fact, recovery is likely. Um, consequently, suicide rates for people diagnosed with mental illnesses are much, much higher than the general public, and in, in part due to um, stigma. And it has been reported that self-stigma or internalized stigma is a painful side effect of being diagnosed with a major mental illness. Okay. Some additional consequences. <laughs> Uh, for people with mental illnesses is that stigma leads to discrimination in housing and employment. Um, stigma contributes to the great disparities of health care and support services for people with mental illness. Our insurance companies um, support services and care for physical illnesses at much greater rates than for um, psychiatric uh, illnesses. And that the financing of mental health service is inadequate, leading to very unappealing mental health programs. If you've ever visited some of the public mental health programs, there are some shining exceptions to this generalization, but many of them are, are environments that do not inspire hope, <laughs> to put it lightly. Um, we've had enormous budget cuts in Massachusetts, and mental health care was one of the hardest hits um, uh, f service sectors. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, another whole slide on the consequences for people with mental illness. That people 
drop out of psychiatric services in part because they do not want to be known as using mental health services. They don't want to be associated with mental health services. This is particularly true for young adults, college age students, not wanting to uh, participate in services that are in these unappealing environments that are um, uh, communicating hopelessness and not messages of recovery. Stigma, this internalized stigma, leads to social withdrawal, thus depriving people with mental illnesses of the helpful connections and supports. The recovery research has demonstrated over the past, you know, well, 15 years that research has been done about the importance of connection and support in people's experience of recovery. And then we have these, these two powerful forces, external stigma, which pushes people away to the margins, and internalized stigma, which causes people to uh, withdraw socially. So we have programs that perhaps uh, communicate hopelessness, along with isolation, <laughs> that's a great recipe for despair. And despair is not the environment where we heal from any condition, whether that be heart disease, mental illness, you know, a, a fractured leg. Um, a person's experience of despair um, inhibits the healing that's necessary. Um, and so we do see that community attitudes negatively influence recovery rates. Um, but there, there's more in terms of consequences, because we can look at the consequences for family members. Um, people uh, who are diagnosed with mental illnesses have parents, children, sisters, brothers, uh, husbands, wives. Family members are also impacted by the diagnosis. And very often, family members may feel that they are to blame for the illness particularly parents. They feel that I've done something wrong. And um, when people feel blamed, uh, they may feel defensive or ashamed. Um, it's difficult to ask for help when you believe something is all your fault. Uh, family members may also feel um, ashamed, you know, and reluctant to ask for help. Um, once again, there's, there are two forces here, the kind of this internalized stigma that causes me to feel ashamed about what's happening in my family, and this external stigma coming from many mental health professionals who say things, well, the nut doesn't fall that far from the tree, does it? Insinuating that, you know, the whole family is ill, or, you know, really blaming parents um, for the, their struggles of their children. Um, and at this time, you know, when, when a, a family member is diagnosed with a psychiatric illness, living with a psychiatric illness, families need an increased amount of support to cope with mental illness rather than, you know, less support. What families tend to do, like the individual with mental illness, is withdraw, isolate, not seek help. Um, Okay, so that's for individuals and for family members, but there are also consequences for society at large, for all of us, for anyone. Now, I, probably in the first two categories, people with mental illness or a family member, included most of us you know, in this room or most of us listening in the classrooms out above because mental illness touches most people's lives. If you personally haven't struggled or experienced it, someone you know has or family member has. But this, this last slide on consequences is talking about um, kind of the consequences for all of us, any one of us. That discrimination leads to the very, very low rates of um, employment for people with um, psychiatric disabilities. So stigma, which fuels discrimination, contributes to the low rates of employment and it's estimated that only um, that about 80 to 90 percent of people diagnosed with serious mental illness are unemployed. Discrimination also contributes to much higher rates of homelessness for people with psychiatric disabilities. Um, it contributes to the fact that there's very limited mental health services in most states. If you've ever had the experience of seeking mental health services, 
um, it's, it can be very, very challenging to find a service that, ex that, you know, that accepts you or accepts your family member, that takes your insurance, that doesn't have a waiting list, that is attractive, that is something you want to uh, participate in. And even if you find one, this last thing, insurers often create barriers um, to access mental health services. So if you think a loved one needs to be in the hospital and you seek those services, your insurer might say, no, let's, let, let's try him at a day program or let's try him in, in outpatient psychotherapy first when um, you know, you've just gotten your loved one willing to participate in services. Um, so insurers create additional barriers. And again, these, this, these are consequences in part, consequences of stigma surrounding mental illness so that it has a very personal level it, that people are impacted personally but um, you know there's also many societal ramifications of this um, stigma okay so we're going to shift a little bit and talk about coping with stigma how do people cope with stigma and these next few slides are perhaps geared more toward people who've had the lived experience or are having the lived experience of psychiatric illness um, you know but family members also and and I think the general public um, you know first of all educating yourself about mental illnesses, educating yourself and educating others. There's a lot that's now known about mental illness, um, about its you know, etiology, if the, if the cause, or, or treatments, or symptoms, or ways of managing the illness. To insist on adequate and appropriate treatment for yourself or for a friend or family member. That's easier said than done, but to, after doing research, insist on that. Um, don't equate yourself with your illness. Illness is just a small part of who a person is. It's just one aspect. Um, speak up about stigma and discrimination. Don't let it uh, you know, take over. Speak up when you see it. And this is also easier said than done, but don't let stigma create shame and self-doubt. That that is a fight that most people with mental illnesses learn that they must have on a daily basis to step up and say, you know what, I'm not going to let this cause me to feel shame or to doubt myself. Some of the ways to kind of manage the, the reduce the shame and uh, increase your self-confidence is to surround yourself with supportive people. They're out there. The importance of support and connection. So sur surrounding yourself with supportive people. Connect with others who are living with mental illnesses. Share your experiences. Educate or avoid people who demonstrate negative attitudes toward you, toward mental illness, um, because of your diagnosis. Now, I had the experience of, of living with cancer about five years ago, and these steps of, you know, cancer was once a very stigmatized condition, um, but, but the world has changed around that. In terms of education, every hospital I, I went to had a cancer education center for their patients. Psychiatric hospitals don't have those. You know, every, all the information you could possibly want about cancer. However, the Internet is a pretty good source of information of, about mental illnesses. You know, advocating for appropriate treatment. My insurance paid for a second opinion. They encouraged me to get a second opinion. They don't pay for a second psychiatric, <laughs> you know, opinion. Um, you know, speaking up um, and connecting with other people who are living with cancer the hospital offered support groups for women who were living with the same uh, kind of cancer that I had. So, you know, this, this branch of medicine, in, in this case oncology, has moved to a place that assists people to cope with any stigma or uh, the challenges of the illness. Stigma does still exist. There was one woman in my life who was pretty sure my cancer was caused by repressed anger. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my anger wasn't so repressed after she let me know that that was probably the cause. And, um, you know, I, I didn't hang out with her a lot <laughs> during my treatment. You know, I chose to, to be with people who are much more positive and supportive. And the, the kind of the vision we could have for mental health treatment, um, not that, that coping with, uh, 
you know, mental illness and sti- is going to eliminate stigma, but it will help us start. You know, one of the visions we have is to, you know, have these education centers for people who are diagnosed with mental health issues, encourage second opinions, third opinions, fourth opinions if if the treatment um, plan isn't working well for you, surrounding yourself with with supportive people, connecting with others who are living with the same condition. Okay, so I'll go to the next slide as we talk about um, coping and confronting stigma. People with mental illnesses have joined together um, to assist each other to cope with stigma. There's a lot of peer support and mutual support groups. Um, People have also formed or joined advocacy groups um, to fight for the rights of people diagnosed with mental illnesses. You know, the, the Mental Health Advocacy Coalition, the National Association for Protection and Advocacy, um, and many, many, many more. This is another kind of area I'd encourage you to get online and look at what's out there. There are an enormous number of groups out there for people. Um, but I want to talk about something we do right here at Boston University in our Recovery Education Center. Um, we're, uh, since 2002, Uh, Students of Boston University's Recovery Education Center have been taking a class called the Anti-Stigma Empowerment and Advocacy Photo Voice to document stigma and advocate for changes in policies, attitudes, and practices. Okay. Now, probably see the word photo voice and wonder, well, what is that? Um, Photo voice is a research process, but it's a process by which people can identify represent and enhance their community through the creation of photographs and narratives uh, designed to capture important aspects of the community experience. So uh, a group of, of citizens or community members come together and with cameras capture in pictures and then write narratives in words some phenomenon in their community. In this case, here at the center, we were looking at stigma, okay? Now I wanna say a a bit about photo voice, that it was a concept first developed in the field of public health by Caroline uh, Caroline Wang and uh, Marianne Burris. Um, And they they used photo voice to uh, study um, many uh, phenomenon in a variety of communities, whether it was, you know, with uh, young women, who were pregnant in Detroit or, you know, rural women in China, they put cameras in the hands of these, you know, underrepresented groups and had them go out and kind of capture in pictures and words what was happening in their community. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, The photo voice process is pretty easy. It's not rocket science, as we say. It's a... We come together as a class and we think about uh, and discuss the issue, in this case, stigma. What is stigma? How have you experienced stigma? What are the negative labels associated with stigma? Um, We think early and often, who are our audiences? Who in our community need to see our work? Who needs to learn about stigma? And we have brainstormed uh, a list of people, including, you know, the commissioner of mental health to, you know, the pastor at someone's local church and the other church members. And so we think through of who are the audiences, Um, certainly uh, other people with mental illnesses, mental health professionals. um, Because the purpose of photo voice is not just for us as a class to have this kind of cathartic open opening experience, although that does happen. The real purpose of photo voice is to educate policymakers and citizens to change attitudes. Um, We brainstorm together, think through ideas of what would make a good photograph. And most times people are, as we think in the classroom, people draw a blank. But once you put the cameras in the hands of people, their imaginations run wild. And um, taking photographs is the next step. Then we um, share and discuss our photographs. We write a narrative that accompanies the photograph that says, you know, pictures worth a, th- worth a thousand words, we add another 200. 100 to 200 words to really 
uh, flesh out that picture. And then we show our work. And I have a couple of examples here. The next slide, though, I just want to make a couple more points about photo voice. Uh, first, that we have trained uh, 12 people who are living with psychiatric disability, mental illnesses, um, to be trainers in photo voice. And so this will be um, you know, a peer-led class from now on. Um, that photo voice has been exhibited in galleries at the state house, mental health programs, churches, et cetera. And we were featured in a 12-minute documentary. We didn't have enough time to show that to you uh, tonight. Uh, but uh, it was aired on cable television. We're quite proud of that uh, piece. Um, but I want to show you a picture and read the narrative so that you can have a, a firsthand experience of what photo voice might be like. Um, this is a picture taken by a woman in our photo voice class. And you can see that it's a picture of a brick sidewalk with a drain. And she says, this drain calls to me because of the hurtful things people have said to me over the decades about my mental illness. In some, I have been told that I am a drain on the nation, on society, a drain on multiple individuals' resources. Over the years, I have come to believe this, which has become a drain on me. Education about mental illness and the effects of trauma should be able to reach out to the general public as well as healthcare professionals. Knowledge and understanding can be powerful weapons in co combating stigma. Okay, so that's one example of mental, of photo voice and fo a photo voice that captured um, an aspect of stigma. Now one picture and one narrative doesn't get the whole message across, but what happens when a whole class does a series of pictures and narrative? The, the pictures kind of speak in concert and give a whole message um, about photo voice, about stigma, I'm sorry. Can we we'll go not to the next one, but the one after that, Sue, please? OK. Um, these, these handouts, these PowerPoint slides, will be put up on the net. They'll be archived very soon, so you can have them. And there are a couple more examples, but I'm mindful of the time. Um, this was a self-portrait done by one of the members in the photo voice class. And he writes this. Uh, newly diagnosed with manic depression, Bobby told his best friend of his illness over a game of golf, only to be hurt and amazed when his buddy lit literally had nothing to say. Bobby's immediate family chooses to be mute on the subject as well, so that his only sources of support and validation come from his wife and therapist. It's no wonder that Bobby has chosen to champion his own cause, including converting the front of his Jeep into a billboard protesting stigma toward the mentally ill. And what you may not be able to see in this picture clearly is that in front, his front license plate says, stop the stigma. Okay. We'll go to the next. Um, so we think about ourselves and, and confronting stigma. Um, to begin, it, you know, one of the things is to avoid prejudging people who are diagnosed with mental illness. One of the things to do this, this may be an automatic response that we too are, are members of this society and so we've been exposed to stigma for so long that it may be an automatic thought. We can only avoid this if we're aware of it, recognizing it in ourselves. Um, to join a group that advocates for people with mental illness. Monitor the media, talk openly about mental illness, and then watching our language. Now, most of you are rehabilitation counselors and students in rehab programs, and so you've probably had a lot of, of uh, lectures on language. But the next slide shows us um, some of the you know, disrespectful, stigmatizing language versus language that's more respectful. We, um, in mental health, as in physical disability, talk about people first language. We don't talk about people as um, manic depressive or the schizophrenic, but rather the person who's diagnosed with bipolar disorder, person diagnosed with schizophrenia, person experience homeless, experiencing homelessness, etc. You know that we don't often use the word normal 
We, we refer to them as a person who is not disabled. Um, and then acronyms, the alphabet soup that comes in our, our field of, of medicine and health and mental health. Um, so many of these acronyms um, marginalize a lot of people, keep, us, keep them out and away from our jargon. So rather than calling people SPMI, severely and persistently mentally ill, or, you know, MICA, MICA, M-I-C-A, which is somebody who has a mental illness and also an addiction disorder. Um, to watch ourselves, watching our language, being aware of our language. Um, and then find also monitoring the media, writing to newspapers who sensationalize crimes by reporting that the perpetrator of the crime had mental illness. Um, watching movies or monitoring movies that perpetuate stereotypes of mental illnesses and develop campaigns, com you know, develop a campaign or join a campaign to boycott these movies. Um, there were several movies, I can't, now I can't think of the titles, that, that over the years have had boycotts organized about them because of their language and the disparaging um, remarks or portrayals of people with mental illness or developmental disabilities. And then finally, writing, or, or writing the networks who produce television shows that depict stereotypes of mental illnesses. The networks tend to be more responsive than even the, the movie um, industry because they're concerned about their sponsors. The National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, NAMI, has a very effective um, media watch, a media campaign, and they're very sensitive to um, portrayals of people with mental illnesses. And so again, looking online to see what are the, what are the campaigns in your area? Where do you, you know, what are the media watch campaigns that are happening? Not that you know, writing a letter to the newspaper isn't going to change the way they write, but over time, and you can see, or some of us who are older can see how language has changed over time, slowly, but in the right direction. Um, I do want to say, uh, spend a few minutes just on talking about um, stigma, mental illness, and colleges. This is an area of concern for uh, the country, the national government is now concerned more about um, mental health on campus. Um, oh, the, it's just the next slide, yep. Um, College-age adults are especially vulnerable to emotional difficulties and depression. And in fact, adults ages 18 to 25 report distressing, more distressing feelings or distressing feelings more often. Um, than any other groups of adults. One in three college students experienced prolonged periods of depression. Uh, one in four students report having suicidal thoughts or feelings. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in college students. One in seven students report difficulty functioning at school due to mental illness. These are large numbers. Despite the fact that, that every school has um, free and accessible counseling services, and most of them have you know, sophisticated behavioral health services. Um, the next slide, please. The, um, that, that stigma and discrimination are major reasons why college students do not seek help in college centers, college health centers. Students are off, often uneducated about the signs and the prevalence of uh, mental health problems in young adults. And significant others, that is family members and professors and even counselors, are very tempted to minimize a young person's symptoms and their suffering. Very reticent to say this could be um, something that medication might help. This could be um, more than just a bad weekend. You know, let's see if... if um, uh, some psychiatric care and support would help. The next slide talks about um, Active Minds, which is a nationwide uh, campus-based um, organization, a national organization based on college and university campuses to help reduce the stigma of mental health problems and help seeking behaviors, and to teach students how to assist friends 
who are struggling with emotional or psychiatric problems. Students live in close proximity to each other, so it's very important that we have the skills to reach out to one another. How do I help a, stu a roommate who hasn't eaten in a week? Or how do I help a, um, you know, a good friend who hasn't left her room? or someone who's drinking heavily. A lot of students don't have the, the skill to do that. Um, and so colleges are looking at these issues with, with much more concern. Um, so we talk about trying to increase awareness and reduce stigma. That's um, to put information and signage about mental health um, in high traffic areas. You know, very often, um, you know, mental health services are in the basement of some obscure building that no one ever goes to, and to put them in much more kind of mainstream center, central place, to incorporate mental health um, issues and orientations and other college-wide information centers, to make presentations about mental health in, um, in classes, in just general classes to train um, campus leaders, that is, resident advisors and officers, and to offer mental health screening days um, to students. So these are just a few suggestions to begin to increase awareness, reduce stigma in mental health, um, for mental health on campus. Um, my hope is that it'll generate um, some discussion amongst the, the students listening to this class. What are the mental health issues on your campus? What are the mental health resources necessary? And what experiences of stigma and discrimination have you witnessed? Um, I'm going to close with that because I want to leave some time for questions, and it is uh, close to 10 of 8. Um, I have um, on the general, um, on the, the PowerPoint slides, I've listed um, a half dozen websites. Uh, three are for kind of general anti-stigma websites. And then three are anti-stigma websites specifically for college students. Um, let me show the next slide. Specifically for college students. And we do have a few questions, so I'm going to take those now. Okay. All right. Um, what do you do? This is a good question. What do you do when someone you work with who is in authority makes an inappropriate remark about a person with mental illness or their treatment? That's a very good question and not an uncommon experience, particularly if you're going out to internships. Um, it, can be, if, it can be very risky to confront an authority figure in front of other colleagues, but one might have an opportunity to speak privately one-on-one -on -one with them, to express your disappointment, your concern, your um, even offense, if, if that is what you feel, to say, rather than, you know, um, not, not to be necessarily language police, but if it's a disparaging remark, to bring it to her attention. Um, one of the, the kind of consequences sometimes of working in mental health settings is that people get very casual about their language. One of the great benefits of having people who are diagnosed with mental illness in the workplace is that it continues to help people stay aware of their language. And so you might be the person on the staff that you know works to increase awareness. So I would advocate speaking privately to um, a supervisor, a person in authority, about the language issue. Um, here's another question. What do you think is the role of stigma in disproportionately high connections of people with men convictions? Convictions? Convictions of persons with mental illness and its impact on perpetuating unemployment, poverty, and homelessness. What kind of law reform is being looked at? Well, there are many, many different things. The convictions meaning for, for crime. For, there are many, one of the consequences of a poor mental health system, of a, of a service net that is not attending to everyone's people's basic needs in addition to their uh, mental health needs is this enormous rate in, of people with serious mental illnesses being charged and convicted of crimes and spending time in um, 
in prison, in jails. And there is some law reform looking at mental health courts and drug courts to help people avert um, doing uh, criminal time um, and instead getting linked into uh, mental health services and supports. Um, not every state has um, these mechanisms, but many states are looking at those mechanisms. Um, and th there are other things in terms of uh, organizing mental health services around people who have the highest need for services and supports. Case management was a response in one way, and some of the more intensive models of case management have been used to assist people who are at risk for jail or at um, you know, risk for homelessness. Um, unemployment, homelessness, substance use are really a formula for <laughs> criminal activity. Um, and um, they're, in addition, you know, having additional supports is helpful. And then what are some of the world's cultures where mental illness is not stigmatized? Well, these, are, these cultures are getting fewer and further between, but there are still some cultures, some, uh, certainly some tribal cultures in um, Africa in which uh, serious mental illness is not looked upon as, a, a, um, as uh, something negative but perhaps the person is different and in touch with uh, spirits. More, um, you know, I don't want to use the word primitive, but more kind of village, tribal-based cultures um, that continue to have roles for people who have um, psychiatric illnesses um, tend not to stigmatize it as much. Um, the more developed um, or developing and kind of first world nations tend to have the highest degrees of, of um, stigma. Okay, are there any other questions in here? I'm getting signals. Are there more questions? Okay, you can call some questions in if you haven't already um, called them in. The number again is uh, one. Area code 508-843-6042. Thank you. Write it down. Um, oh, wait, there's a mic. Go ahead, Stephanie. Go ahead. There's a mic microphone there. You can... <laughs> a little technical difficulty. We're trying to get a microphone to the in-house audience right now. What should someone do if they have a very dear friend who is so near coming to the edge and that person makes you swear that they don't want you to discuss it with anyone mm. who might help that person because they feel that if they are once again stigmatized like that by being talked about, that they will go over the edge. Hmm. Sounds like the, the, the question you've probably heard, what do you do when a friend asks you not to say anything because they don't wish to be stigmatized again, and, and yet you see them going over the edge, and it sounds like they've put you in a very difficult situation. Um, and um, I mean, I think if I'm, I'm speaking now, not maybe directly to your question, but to college students, what do you do when someone says, you know, don't tell anybody that, you know, I'm, I'm not eating or that I'm so depressed or that I caught myself? What, what do you do? Um, and, you know, you, you may have to respond that I can't promise that I'm not going to tell because I'd like to see you get some help. I'd like you to get some help with your difficulty. And I think one of the, the reasons people talk about, you know, don't tell anybody is fear of stigma, fear of discrimination. Um, certainly on college campuses, mental health authority there is, is, is often very, you know, um, very uh, well conditioned to attend to the issues of young adults. Um, and so eating disorders, self-injury, depression, anxiety disorders are quite common on college campuses, and mental health resources are, are geared toward assisting people. So you may not be able to keep your promise of not telling anybody is...
probably the best response. If you're concerned about somebody falling over the edge, um, you may not be able to keep your promise. Okay, another question? No, we haven't had any phone calls, so that's a very good thing. All right. Okay, one more here. Sorry, there is another question. As a family member, I wonder what, how things could be different. How, how can I teach my grandchildren hmm. about the mental illness in my family? Yeah. Generational. Right, generational. How can we teach our families? One of the things that has happened that is, is very, very promising is most bookstores have an enormous section on recovery. And that used to be just recovery from, you know, addiction, you know, to alcohol and drugs. Now the recovery section talks a lot about depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety disorder, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. So if you visit a bookstore, you're very likely to find some good quality books. Now that may be more true in great me metropolitan centers. The um, substance abuse, one of the websites that I gave you, there, the, in the slide before this, um, um, Sam said the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration is the federal agency that um, oversees mental health services. And they have some very good pamphlets um, that give information about a variety of disorders, um, kind of what are the symptoms, what is the typical treatment, you, you know, talks a lot about it. And often now in their flyers, it's not just a kind of a clinical picture, they have first-person accounts, first-person stories of uh, people who experience that disorder. And so they can be a great source of free resources. Um, they also have some things for, for children, geared toward children uh, who have parents or perhaps grandparents who are living with mental health issues. Um, SAMHSA also has um, information for children who may be experiencing some mental health issues for the very first time. So really for the first time in history, mental health services are moving in the direction that many of the other fields of medicine have mo moved toward, toward you know, patient education, patient empowerment, thinking about choice, thinking of you know, personal goals. There's a long way to go, but that's beginning. And so we can hope that you know, a decade from now, two decades from now, stigma will be, you know, something of the past. Stigma and mental health issues may be something more of the past. You know, in, in the history of the United States, there have been groups that have been stigmatized, and we don't even know it. Like, it's not even a part of it now. Like here in Boston, you know, the Irish were very stigmatized against uh, about 50 years ago. And now, you know, not at all. It's, it's, a, it's a dim memory most people don't, don't even uh, reach back that far. Um, and so, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a mental health may go the same way, mental illness may go the same way of, of stigma being reduced. Usually how that happens is high profile people begin to talk about it. We've been very fortunate in this country that we've had um, First Lady Rosalind Carter and uh, Tipper Gore, I guess second lady, <laughs> former second lady Tipper Gore, who have taken on mental health, mental health um, issues and mental stigma of mental illness as core challenges for them. They've really fought against it. The, the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia is a wonderful place, resource to go for information about stigma and stigma busting kinds of activities. Okay. Do we have time for one more question? I don't think so. Well, do we have time for one more question? One more. Yep. Okay. A short one. I just easy one. No. Okay. <laughs> just became aware two weeks ago from looking at his Facebook. My 21-year-old nephew um, has it written out that he's feeling very suicidal. He is an acknowledged drug addict. He is an alcoholic. And he uh, is gay, and I'm not putting in gay there because I think there's a problem with that, as opposed to that poses many issues for a young man in the world. 
and he's not going to be graduating from college in May, as my brother and sister-in-law thought. The bottom line is that um, I don't know what to do because neither my brother nor my sister-in-law tolerate depression or any Mm. So as an aunt, what, what could be your role? And it's very yes. difficult when you're not a parent, and it's very difficult with young adults. The, the person 21 years old is, is an adult and can make his own decisions about what kind of services and supports that I'm willing to go for. For many, many people, um, you know, the role of the aunt is to give unconditional love and support, um, you know, praise and encouragement, and um, that's that's the role of an aunt. <laughs> and I think that's, you know, the one we have to embrace. As family members, we're not asked to become everybody's therapist, you know. Um, we can continue having our role as a, as a family member. Um, and just because somebody is experiencing psychiatric illness, psychiatric disability, doesn't mean everyone in his life now needs to become therapeutic. <laughs> you know, we we can continue being the younger sister and the, or the the aunt the cousin the friend okay so i think with that we will will we will end the um powerpoints should be archived and on the web pretty soon i would hope and and um Again, if you wish to contact um, the Center for Psychiatric Rehabilitation, you can do so. Um, we are also on the web. Okay, thank you very much for your attention tonight. Good night.